on some independent force, or how am I supposed to think about, or how would you characterize Satan? Okay. This Gemara recently we have in Dafyomi, the Gemara says, the Satan, the Yitzhara, the Malchamovis. Satan, Satan, the evil inclination, and the angel of death, it's the same power. It's all the same. But each one is another context. Satan means the prosecutor. That's the Satan. Yetzara is the evil inclination. It seduces one and creates an inclination to do something which is contrary to the will of Hashem. That's Yetzara. Malchabovis is at the end of the day, when it's time for a person to die, the angel of death was created to take the person's soul. But it's all the same. Because why does a person die? As we said, Gemara tells us that four people died four people never sinned in their lives. But the reason why they died was because of the seduction of the snake because Chava had eaten from the tree of knowledge. So it's rooted in because the sin, the consequence, the impurity of sin is intermingled with the human being. That's why the person has to die. So initially, the, the prosecutor prosecutes because you cross those lines that you shouldn't have crossed the lines. The inclination, the yetzara, that's evil inclination, you're inclined to do the wrong thing, that's a seduction. At the end of the day, the reason why the person dies, the angel that takes his life is what? This is the angel of death. Because of the impurity which exists within the person, that's the angel of death. The Gemara tells us also, just said it now, that Aaron had died in the Shiko. It was the kiss of kiss of death. Angel of death, did, angel of death did not take his soul. Hashem took his soul. Miriam, Hashem took her soul. Moshe Rabbeinu, Hashem took his soul. Dover Amelech, Hashem took his soul. But everyone else, the angel of death, death takes their soul. The angel, when the angel takes takes one soul, in terms of the um, experience, it's another experience than if Hashem takes. For Hashem to take a person's soul, that person has to be at exceptional level, which is one of a kind of a level. And then we could count them on one hand. However, everyone, regardless of how pure he is, he's not pure enough that he should merit that Hashem should take a soul. Therefore, the angel of death which represents the basis for once death is sin, that angel takes takes the person's soul. Okay, now, Rav Chaim Velozhna, in his introduction to, to Ruach Chaim, his commentary on Pirkei Ovis writes that the Gemara tells us that the angel of death, the Satan, he seduces the person, and after he finishes seducing the person, when it comes to be prosecuted, the one who seduced, he's the one who actually prosecutes the person. So meaning you'd say almost like it's entrapment. First he seduces you, and then afterwards he comes and he prosecutes you for the seduction which he had seduced you. So he cites a Zohar. The Zohar says, what is it in the Alchus 2? A king says to his minister, my son is very special. However, for him to be able to assume certain responsibilities and for me to rely on him, he has to with, withstand the test of fire. And if he makes it through that test, then he will be my special prince and I will give him those levels of responsibility. And he says, I want you to take a purse of gold and I want you to convince him and seduce him that he should go to, to, to a brothel. If he doesn't go to the brothel, then he's what? Then he makes the grade. He's worthy of to assume very special levels of responsibility. But if he fails, then he will not be who he's meant to be. And the minister, minister goes, and he tries to seduce the son. The son is not seduced, is not willing to buy it. He reports back to the king, your son withstood the test of fire. Despite the degree of seduction I gave him, he did not succumb to seduction. The king is ecstatic. But Otherwise, if the son fails, that means, but the minister was given the means at every level to seduce the son, 
Now it's up to the son. Does he withstand the seduction? Does he withstand the seduction? But he has the capacity to withstand seduction. The HRA was created, an angel, was given all the means to seduce a person, to fail. But the person has the ability, and that's what we call free choice. As the Ram says, Silkos Chuva, every person has the ability to withstand whatever that seduction may be. You have that ability. So the angel, the evil inclination sent to the person, ultimately, if, to be in his best interest, in his best interest. Because if he succeeds, then he scores big. That's the full Sarah Agra. According to one's challenges, that's the degree of reward. The more difficult the challenge, the greater the success. That brings greater joy to Hashem. But if the child, if the son, if we fail, then Hashem is saddened because he has to punish us. So the angel that was created to seduce us was only, he's doing the will of God. And he's given all the means to bring about that seduction. Because ultimately, if the person does not succumb, that means he succeeded in a very, very significant way. However, he fails, the same angel that was sent to seduce him, he comes and reports back to the king, your son failed. So that's what it means. The, the angel first seduces, and the person fails, he's the one who actually prosecutes. When, the, when, when, when God goes and evaluates the record, that's the prosecuting angel, and he attests to the fact that son did not make it. That's the Zohar. At the end of time, when it says the Yetzirah will be destroyed, it doesn't mean the angel will be destroyed. What the angel is doing, the angel is a good angel. What it means to say that that mission of seduction to cause the person to fail, that mission is not going to be, be, be in place any longer. It's not necessary. Because when we come to the end of time, we've no, the challenge is not there anymore. You had to succeed up to that point. Beyond that point, there's no longer challenges. You're not seduced. So if that's the case, this angel, that uh, capacity or that ability becomes obsolete. So that's what the show us like he goes and he was slaughtered the Yitzhara. Meaning that power, that ability becomes negated. Because the need for that is no longer there. So the angel turns out is a good angel. Because he did the will of God at every level. Not to any degree less or more than Hashem wanted him to do. In Nefshech Hayim, Paro's mistake was Paro understood all the deities. And that's the reason why when Moshe had come to him and said, Hashem elokei so shlochani alechem. Hashem yudkei vovkei. The God of Israel, Yisrael, not Elokei Elok, 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 He didn't say the God of the Hebrews. Elokei Yisrael has sent me. So he, used to, he said two things. Yudke Vovke, which represents the infinite. And also Yisrael, which is the spiritual profile of Yaakov. Which he's not subject to any physical uh, criteria. He transcends the physical. He trans transcends the zodiac. He's not subject. Anybody else in existence, any other nation, is subject to whatever the Zodiac dictates you're subject to that. We we can override the Zodiac. That's that's mean a mazel Yisrael. A Jew has no mazel. Mazel means we do, we're born under a star. However, we could change the mazel with tefillah and also with tzchus. If you have sufficient merit, tzchus at tzib, we could change mazel. The non-Jew cannot change it. It's etched in stone, that's the way it is. Can't be done differently. He comes to, so he says according to one opinion, Haro had believed that God was created the world initially. However, he gave it over to the hosts of heaven for them to dictate and control existence. And each angel represents another aspect of existence, a component, powers. But once he created those powers, God has no control over those powers. He's locked into it. And he gives an example, uh, a a tool maker creates a weapon. Once he creates that weapon, that weapon is given into somebody else's uh, possession, that person killed the tool maker with that weapon. The tool maker has no control over that weapon anymore. It's identical. Once God created the world, created these powers, these powers now are independent of Hashem and he can't control them. That was Paro, according to one opinion. 
So he believed initially ex nihilo became, but once it became, God no longer has control. However, Yudke Vavke represents God is infinite. Nothing exists outside of God. And whatever exists, it's only because that God wills that to be as it is every moment. And there should be a moment that he ceases that you will, it should exist. It doesn't exist any longer. That's Rav Chaim Veloshna, how he explains Paro's position and when Moshe came. And that's why Paro said, Mi Hashem Hashem He took out his encyclopedia of deities. He says, he's not listed. That, that's what Paro said to Moshe Rabbeinu. There's no such thing as Yud Kei Vav Kei. And there's no such thing as Yisroel because everything's locked into these powers. There's nothing that exists outside of these powers. Of entrapment. You know, the, the government, it, it was entrapment. The whole concept of entrapment is because I created a setting that it's 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 so difficult, it's not possible to not be drawn in to do the wrong thing. There's no such thing as that. You know, we once asked the question, I think maybe Mark asked it. It was a very, because I, I asked the question to many people and they can't answer it. There's a Torah violation of Nida Lusite Mikshol. Person becomes a nazir. You're not permitted to offer. To, to, if he comes to you, he says he wants to purchase wine, you're not permitted to sell him the wine because there's a chance he may he may drink the wine. A non-Jew is not permitted to eat even a limb of a, a living animal. You're not permitted to sell him that because it's one of the shev mitzvah neinoach. So that's lifnei velusiti mosho. So lifnei velusiti mosho. You're not permitted to put a stumbling block before a blind man. Doesn't make a difference to a Jew or non-Jew. If it's an area which it's forbidden, you're not permitted. So the question was: every time the Yetzer approaches us, it's, Hashem is, is in violation of He's seducing us because there's a chance we may fail. He's tempting us. So how do so how does Hashem? He tells us not to do it. He does it continuously. That's what life is all about. From the beginning of existence till the end of existence till Mashiach comes. It's all the Fnev of the That was the question. Mark, I don't know if we discussed this. So what I said was, the difference is this. When I go and present something to someone where he's not permitted in that particular area, and he may cross the line, do I know whether he's going to cross the line, doesn't cross the line? I don't even know if he has the ability to withstand the temptation that I'm presenting to him. Therefore, just as a blind man, he can't see and he's going to stumble, therefore you have no right to create a setting where that person may stumble. When Hashem presents any test, as difficult it is, God knows I've given you the means to be able to succeed, not to succumb. That's why it's not lifting the city Michel. When a human being presents a test to another person, you don't know if he's going to cross that line. Do you know if he has the ability? But does it? Therefore, that's called entrapment, that's called seduction, whatever you want to call it. And therefore, it's forbidden. When the sudden comes and seduces a person, the person has the means to withstand that, to deflect it. It may be difficult, but he has the means. And if he does it, it's what? He succeeded. That's why when Hashem presents anything, knowing the person has the ability because he's given that ability, that's the reason why that context is not a context of the Fnei the Sittim Nef Shol. The name of some sofa, my Roshuzhan Rav always used to, used to say it over that the Gemara tells us in Ksubis, Hanaim Shovazario were in the court of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian emperor. And he had made an image of himself and he had ordered that every subject has to bow to this image. And if you did not, you were killed. You were thrown into the lion's pit or you were thrown into a kiln. These three courtiers in his court, they would not. And he what? And he threw him to the kiln. And just as Avramavim came out alive out of the kiln, they came out alive of the kiln. Came out. So the Gemara says in Ksubis, why were they able to withstand this test? Because death was instantaneous. Going to the kiln, you just become incinerated. But if the evil if they would have beaten them, they would have bowed. They would have bowed to the image because they couldn't withstand the level of pain. They would have bowed. 
So Tosa has a question. We know that of all the sins of the Torah, when it comes to idolatry, it's Yehore Val Yavor. You have to give your life. You're not permitted under any circumstance to, to transgress, even if it means your life. So how is it possible to say these three tzaddikim that Hashem performed this miracle on their behalf, that if they would have been beaten, they would have succumbed, they would have bowed. How is it possible? That's Tosa's question. So Tosa's answer is, when it says he made the image, it wasn't an image of idolatry. He wanted to establish himself as a deity. He didn't succeed. So at the time, if they would have bowed, it wasn't really idolatry. However, Hassam Sofer explains it this way. The Gemara says, if they would have beaten, they would have bowed. Because they couldn't withstand the pain. So the question is, so why didn't they beat them? One, Hashem should have created a scenario where they should have been beaten. You know what the answer is? Because they wouldn't have the mean, they wouldn't have had the ability to withstand that level of pain. Therefore, as a result of that, they were given the choice of instantaneous death. So he says, because a person, every choice we have, it's only in a context they have the ability to overcome that that challenge. But if it's something which is beyond your capacity, that's not a, that's not a test. So because it would have been too difficult for them, that's the reason why they were not given that test because they were wouldn't been able to withstand the pain. So that's, he says, anytime we're ever confronted with any situation, you should know in advance that don't delude yourself to say it's too difficult because the reason why it presented itself, it's only because you do have the ability to be able to withstand the test and succeed. Yes. The previous parsha, we were in um, approaching Eretz Yisrael and we want to go through the Edomite territory. Edom would not let us through. So now we're confronted with Sichon, the territory of Sichon. He's a giant. And we go to war with Sichon. We, we destroy Sichon. We conquer that whole area. Then there's another giant, Og Melchaboshon. And Moshe Rabbeinu is, kills him also. And we conquer, we capture all his territory, all the people are killed. Og and Sichon, these two giants, they were the protectors of Canaan. They would sit at, at the border and they were paid a very significant fee to be the protectors of Canaan that any nation, any invading army that would come, they would immediately destroy them. They were giants. But now that they were destroyed, they were killed by the Jews. Now, Bullock realizes they're vulnerable. Now, how do you stop the Jews from coming in? As they destroy Ogem Sichon, which seems to be, which means it's only through miraculous means, what, what chance do we have to survive? It's hopeless. And when Bullock realized this, there's only one way to deal with, with the ability of the Jew. We got to fight fire with fire. Moshe Rabbeinu, his ability is with his mouth. His power is in his mouth. We'll see in a minute what does it mean. Moshe Rabbeinu spent many years in Bidjan. His father was Yisro, spent maybe 60 years there. So they, and when he was there, he did tremendous things, miraculous things. So what he did is due diligence on Moshe Rabbeinu, his homework, he found out that his ability is in his mouth. As it says, when he killed the Egyptian, how did he kill the Egyptian? When he saw the Egyptian build, beating the Jew, it says he killed him with the Shem of Mephorosh. He said one of the names of Hashem and the equivalent, he zapped him. He died. He did not physically touch him. He just enunciated one of the names of Hashem and he, he just on the spot, expired, died on the spot. Says his power is with his mouth. Bilam, being the nation of the world, it was known his power was with his mouth. As he says to Bilam when he tries to commission him, what you bless is blessed, and what you curse is cursed. Because we find that the Jews were not permitted to conquer the territory of Moab. They weren't permitted. And this over here, Moab got involved in a situation which they had no right to get involved in. Moab. 
But yet, the territory we took from Sichon originally was the territory of Moab. So the Gemara tells us, based on the Pasuk, that the reason why we were able to take that territory was was Tiro B'Sichon. Since Sichon captured the territory, and based on the laws of war, anything you capture becomes your territory. So we took the territory from Sichon, although originally it was the territory of Moab, we were permitted to take it. That's not considered taking the territory of Moab. Because Sichon was able to actually conquer it. Now the question is, Sichon wanted to conquer part of that territory. He wasn't able to do it. So what did he do? He went and he commissioned Bil Bilam, and Bilam, Sichon the giant, because this has to do more than physical, this has to do with spiritual powers. Bilam was able to work it out. He went and he cursed them, and based on the curse, Sichon was able to conquer that territory. So he saw Sichon's power, Bilam's power was in his mouth. Physical might, Sichon had the might, but yet he couldn't conquer them. So therefore, knowing what the power of the Jews is based on the power of Moshe, whose power is in his mouth, we're going to commission somebody who's his equivalent to be able to counter his entry into, into Canaan. This is the backdrop on this. I'd said something, uh, I'm not sure I said it in the past, I've said it, but it's it's difficult. We find that we read about the passing of Aaron last week's parsha. When did Aaron pass away? Right after they came within the proximity of Edom, and Edom would not let them come in, Hashem says to Moshe, take Aaron and Loza and go on to Horahor, and he's going to pass away. So Rashi over there cites Chazal. Why does the Torah juxtapose the passing of Aaron to the wanting to go through the Edomite territory? Because when a person is exposed, your actions become breached. That's the reason why Aaron was taken. Our actions were breached. So the obvious question is, usually very often we find, when is there such a unfortunate situation? If the Jews sin, as a result of that, Hashem takes the tzaddik. So if we would have been actually, due to that exposure, we would have sinned. We understand our own was the kapur, was the atonement. But it says, we approached Edom, they would not let us go through, they came against us with the sword, and we went away. And soon afterwards, because we were exposed to the Rosha, that the actions of the tzaddikim are breached. How do we understand this? What does Edom represent? Edom represents the physical world. Yaakov represents the spiritual world. And when they were fighting in the womb, as it says, the fetuses, they were rumbling. There was agitation in her womb, and she went to shame for reading of what was going on. She says, the two nations in your womb, and they're, they're, each one is the antithesis of the other. One, it represents evil, represents physicality in the most exaggerated level, and the other one represents spirituality. And the fighting over both worlds, but the conclusion was, Esau is the physical world, and Yaakov is what? Is the spiritual world. Yaakov is Tam Yoshe Goholim. He was the man of the tent. The Medjish tells us in Yalkot that when Yaakov realized that uh, Esau was coming towards him with 400 men. It says he prepared in three areas. He prepared, he prayed, he prepared for war, and he sent a gift. The gift was a very elaborate gift. And this was only a small percentage of his, of his, of his assets. Herds and flocks and diamonds, all kinds of things. When finally he met Esau, and Esau, somehow, he was able to diffuse his anger. Esau looks at what he received him. He says, what's this all about? He says, it's a gift to find favor in your eyes. That's why I sent it to you. So Esau says, oh, I have a question. We have an agreement that this world is my world, and your world is a spiritual world. How do you come to all this, all this wealth? That's the question Esau asked Yaakov. 
Evidently, seems to be this is this is called uh, this embezzlement. You had no right to take it. You went and you infringed on my my domain by having all this wealth. So Jacob says to Esav, "You don't understand. This world is not my world to, for the world to be for its own sake, but as a means to be able to achieve what I'm meant to achieve. That I have a right to partake of this world, and that's what it says. Yeshli Kol, I have everything." Whatever God gave me, it's only because it's only to facilitate my spiritual objective. But it's not the physical for the physical. That's what it, Yaakov said to Esau. So Esau says, you know something? If that's the case, maybe we should re redivide. Let's redivide it. We'll split half and half. You, I'll have half the physical world, and I'll have half the spiritual world, and you will. He says, no. Once we established that agreement, we're not undoing the agreement. Spiritual world is mine, physical world is yours. And, however, I have a right to utilize the physical to facilitate the spiritual. And that's where it was left. That's Asaph. Now, what's what's going to be the end of Asaph? Volum Moshim Haratzi Lishwaris Haratzi Lishwaris Haratzi Voyse Lashem Luko Voy Hashem Melcha Kolos Kial Kesko Amolik is me obliterated. Asaph, who represents evil. Is goes into the oblivion. That's Esau. Esau son of Yaakov. That is what Esau is. That's Edom. Now, the Chofetz Chaim goes and explains with an allegory, with a marshal, that people, they see other people, Russia Vitovlo, and they're envious of the Russia. I mean, here the man does what he wants. And there's no divine retribution. And uh, he's living high in the hog over here. There's nothing which God doesn't deny him. Everything he has. And people have envy. So the Chofetz Chaim says, if a person would understand what's going on, there would be a moment of envy. Why? See, he explains what a marshal. Now, explain when I mentioned the, the allegory, you probably remember just at least the marshal you remember. There was this minister who had spoken out of turn to the king. And the king said, because of that, it's going to cost you your life. However, the way you're going to die, it's going to be in the most grotesque way, which people initially won't understand what's going on. So he gave an order. They should build the palace, which is a replica of his own palace. It's furnishings, the stone, everything is a replica of his palace. The furnishings are exactly as his palace. And the tailor of the king should fit this minister with all the royal, royal garments that the king himself wears. However, when they build this palace, you have to have windows from floor to ceiling. So everybody can look into the palace to see what's going on in the palace. And then we're going to put ads in the paper to announce that this minister is being brought into this palace with all the pomp and all the recognition of the ultimate royalty. And he's going in. He goes in and like a king, although he's a commoner. And when he goes in, they lock the door. And people are watching this with envy. They're dripping from envy. They, you can't imagine. A commoner should come upon and be, and have a privilege to have this kind of wealth and this kind of knowledge and recognition, people couldn't understand it. And everybody's watching how he moves his movements in this royal palace, the furnishings, and how he walks with all the, the uh, of a minister. As a minister walks, every step is calculated and everything. And, but they didn't understand one thing. This palace had no water, had no food. So two days passed, three days passed, all of a sudden they notice. And everybody's still watching. The minister becomes pale. A week passes, the minister is famished. He begins tearing flesh out of his, out of his arm. And eventually, he starts eating himself up alive. Because that's all way he could maintain himself. And eventually he looks so grotesque, you couldn't look at him. Until finally he's just 
a, 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 a lump of what? Of decayed, whatever it is, a decayed human being. And people then understood the punishment. That this was the punishment. What they thought initially was the ultimate. What, what did it cost them? This whole, this honor? It was a setting to eat himself up alive. We said that that even the dog who didn't bark in Egypt, it says, you have to throw the meat, not kosher meat, like also. There's no person who doesn't do some good in his life. And therefore, Hashem has to pay him. If he wants him to go into the oblivion, he's paid off in this world. So all that he, the material benefit that he has in this world is a payoff. But ultimately, end of the day, where is he going? He's going to the oblivion. A level of suffering and punishment not to be fathomed. That's rush of a total. So what, the, what you're envious about is something you don't understand with the cost factor, when that cost that person. This is what it's about. That's the Chofetz Chaim. So he says, a person would only understand this, there wouldn't be a moment that you would even want to change places with this person, ever. That's what, what I wanted to say was this. Edom is Olam Hazer. Hashem says you can live high in the hog. You can have power. You're going to have victories. You're going to have everything. The Roman Empire ruled the world for 500 years. They ruled the world supreme. And Edom is still Russia. Edom. Western civilization is Edom. This is all Edom. But what it's going to cost them at the end of the day? They're going into the oblivion. So what we see as the ultimate... When you go into that area, in essence, you know what that is? That's the most extreme level of Midas Adin. That that Hashem gives Edom, the power and the empowerment, and this level of material, this is the ultimate Midas Adin. Now, in Europe, during World War II, the Jews were in Europe, what was World War II? World War II that area of the world was under what? Characteristic of Hashem at that time, Midas Adin. The attribute that was Midas Adin. You could have been Sadiq, you could have been Chosid. It was meant to be. You could have nearly a perfect record, but nobody's perfect. They perished in the Holocaust. The Northern Hemisphere was not on the Midas Adin. The attribute of justice was not. It was Midas Arachni. Therefore, although people were not even a trace of what the others were, they were able to continue. But if you were there, that location, the evaluation was Midi Sadin. When you go to the territory of Edom, what territory are you entering into? A territory where the evaluation is Midi Sadin. But they're living at this exaggerated material level, but that's the ultimate Midi Sadin. So for them, the material is Midi Sadin. For us, when you go into that, that, that territory, that domain, the Midas of this means that the evaluation of the Jew now, it's a different evaluation. The Jew is seen through a different kind of lens. As a result of that, as perfect as we are, when we miscarry the ace of a Russia, Nifritsu Masem Shal Yisrael, our actions become breached because now the evaluation is so exacting and so precise, it's it's not possible, it's not perfect. As a result of that, that's the reason why Aaron had to pass away for that reason. Because only that would suffice to quell the prosecution against Claude Yisrael. That's how we explained it in the past. So, so it was the... This is his Pekiovos. That. Harchik Mishokhin Keep away from the bad neighbor. And you should not be mischab of the Rosha. Don't attach yourself to a Rosha. But don't despair from tragedy. What does it mean? A person wants to have, this, a person is a Rosha, and he's a rainmaker. A rainmaker. So you say, look, you know something? I'll be involved with him in business, but outside of that, I have nothing to do with the man. Al tischab the Rosha. Don't attach yourself to Russia. Because someday, when the second shoe falls, anybody who's attached to him falls together with him. 
When he goes into the oblivion, anybody who has that level of association with him is going to is going to experience the same fate. It's mission Pirkei Obos. What does it mean? It means this. Al Tzchabel Rosho. When you attach yourself to Rosh, that means you're on the same pedestal as he is. That that he's succeeding and you're justifying your association with him and you want it, you're interested because he has all this financial success and so on and so forth, but you don't realize all that, that's Midas Adin. That is the attribute of justice. Therefore, when it's time for Hashem to pull the plug on this guy, anybody who's attached to him, he's going to pull the plug on all of them. Because the valuation, what he's experienced, despite his evil, and he's succeeding in the material, that's the ultimate midas adin. So therefore, don't delude yourself to think that ultimately the tragedy is not going to happen. It's going to happen. And when it happens, anybody who is attached to him is going to experience the same level of tragedy.